Chapter 17 Once round Castle Rock and the Needles, they can run before the wind, down past Manatee Bay and the great ridge line above wheeling as they rush on, doubling at last the southwest point, and presently the day's meal is flopping about the deck. They have lost the wind. The absence stuns him. Breezes, tides and eddies must now get them past this coast. The crew, who've been at it, out in it for a few days, find a mason's discompobulancy amusing. That their remarks are not in English sends him further a reel. When they debark him at the mouth of Breakneck Valley, two or three miles from the town, he is more than eager to be off. He can smell the town upon the wind, the smoke and muck piles, long before he sees it. Awakening from a sort of road trance, he finds himself before the Jenkins Ear Museum, dedicated to the eponymous organ whose timely display brought England in against Spain in the War of 39. Not long after, Robert Jenkin went to work for the East India Company. Many styled it a quid pro quo. Being assigned to St. Helena in 41 as governor and bringing with him the influential ear. Already by then, in casked in a little showcase of crystal and silver and pickled in Atlantic brine. James's town wove its spell. Eventually, at cards, Mr. Jenkin extended his credit too far even for Honourable John. There remained the last unavoidable object of value, which he bet against what proved to be a cross rough, whence it passed into the hand, hands of Nick Morneville, an enterpriser of the town. Mason is chagrined to find, set in a low wall, a tiny portico and gate no more than three feet high, with a sign one must stoop to read. Ear of Robert Jenkin, Esquire, within. Clearly there must be some other entry, though Mason can find none, not even by repeated jumps to see what lies over the wall. To appearance, a garden gone to weeds. Reluctantly at last, he takes to his elbows and knees to investigate the diminutive doorway at close hand. The door, after a light push, swinging open without a squeak. Mason peers in. What illumination there is reveals a sort of rampway leading downward with just enough height to crawl Owing to a certain corporate surplus accumulated at Cape Town, Mason's smooth descent is here and there in doubt. Each time, indeed, though but temporarily stuck, he comes near panic. At last, having gained a slightly roomier sort of foyer, hone, it seems, from the volcanic rock of the island, he is startled by a voice quite near. Good day to you, pilgrim, and thanks for your interest in a great modern secular relic. Helen of Troy's face may have launched a thousand ships. 
This is but one year, yet in its time it sent navies into combat round the globe. Think of it as the closest thing you are apt to see to Helen's face. And for one pistol, tis a bargain. Bit steep, isn't it? Where, um, are you, by the way, the echo in here? Look in front of you. Yeah! Ta-ra! Yes. Here all the time. Nick Morneville, formerly Esquire, now your servant. Once a company director, now, as you see, Fortune's wheel is on the rise or fall, where we go. But nowhere does it turn quite as furiously as here, upon this unhappy mountain top in the sea. You are Florinda's friend. We met before the battery one evening. She is well, I trust. She is flown. Some chicken nabob, nabob, travelling home with his mother. Watched her work him, masterful. She knew I was observing and put on a show. Her stage training, humiliating, of course. Well, brightly. Where's the air then? Just have a look, if I may, and be off. Dear no. That's not how it's done. I must come along to operate the show. Excuse me? Show? Naive Mason. First, he must endure the Spaniard's crime, the ear displayed to Parliament, the declaration of war, with Morneville speaking all the parts and putting in the sounds of cononades, cannonades and storms at sea, traffic in Whitehall, Spanish jabbering and the like, and providing incidental music upon the mandolin from Mr. Squivelli's Lurecchio Fatale, that is, the fateful ear. A disquisition upon Jenkins' ear ring? Aye, twas never Mr. J's ear the Spaniard was after, but the great ruby in it. For one silver shilling, you may now view this remarkable jewel, red as a wound, plucked from the navel of an importantly connected notch dancer by a mate of a coaster who should have known better. Passing them, then, from scoundrel to scoundrel, though death to possess, yet coveted passionately from the northern sea to the farther swamps of the Indies. The brutal and dishonourable tale of Bengal and the Carnatic in the days of the company, till it settled, in to dangle beneath the fateful lobe of Mr. Jenkin, and wait, a throb with unluckiness, the Spaniard's blade. In the straight and increasingly melodorous space where they crouch, awash in monologue and vocal tricks, Mason's only diversion is what Mr. Morneval by now seeming more openly deranged styles, the chronoscope, which, for a fee, may be squinted into. Here, in all colours of the prism, sails the brig Rebecca, forever just about to be intercepted by the infamous Garda Costa. Mason's squint is not merely wistful. The ship's name is a message from across some darker sea. As he has come to believe in a meta metaphysical escape for the seahorse back there off breast, 
much like this very depiction. The event not yet reduced to certainty, the day stilled, oceanic, an ascent, a reclaiming of light, wind expressed as its integral, each sail a great held breath. Into just such a dispensation that far-off morning had he risen like a child. India, all islands possible, the open, inextinguishable light, his last morning of immortality. And finally, a salute to the career of Mr. Jenkin with the EIC featuring his brief and not dishonourable tenure as governor here. Nick Morneville's tortoise pick begins to vibrate upon the notes of Rule Britannia as a life-sized portrait of Jenkin now shimmers into view. The missing ear, tastefully disguised by the excursions of a wig of 20 years ago, and the curriculum vitae is grandly recited. All this while, the ear reposes in its pickling jar of Swedish lead crystal, as if being withheld from time's appetite for some destiny obscure to all. Presently, tis noted by Mason, he hopes an effect of the light, that somehow the ear has been aglow, for a while, too. Withal, it seems as he watches to come to attention, to gain muscular tone, to grow indeed quite firm and in its saline bath, erect. It is listening. Quickly, Mason grips himself by the head, attempting to forestall panic. Aha! Mr. Morneville breaks off his narration. Good for you, sir. Some of them never do smoke it, you know. Yes, of course, ears been listening. What are ears for? And to be honest, there's not much to do down here. Ear may look small and brine soaked to some, but I can tell you she's one voracious vessel. Can't get enough of human speech. She'll take anything in any language. Sometimes I must sit and read to her. The Bible, the lunar tables, the ghastly fop, whatever comes to hand. Tis ear's great hunger that never abates. Ear? Oh, what would you call her? Nose? I uh, but wished not to speak inappropriately. Mason's eyes swivelling about more and more wildly, failing to locate the egress. You're a sporting gentleman. I recognise your style. Been to any number of London clubs in me time. How'd you like to... His nudge in this underground intimacy comes like an assault. Get a little closer. Maybe tell her something in private. As much as the space allows, he now flourishes a key. Um... Perhaps I'll just, could you actually kindly point me to the way out? Mr. Morneville has unlocked the vitrine and reached into the sea glow within. You ought not leave, sir, till you've spoken into ear. She'll be a much better judge of when you may go. And will cost but a rick's dollar more. What? Be advised, I am empowered to use violence. I have a warrant from the company. Here then, take take two Rick's dollars. Why not? Only Dutch money, isn't it? No more real 
than the Cape be in that terrible dream that has seized and will not release them? Don't tell me, shrugs Mr. Morneville. Tell ear. It's just the sort of chat up she fancies. Treat for you today, ear, he cries, startling Mason into a back twinge he would rather not have. Go ahead, sir. Put your lips as close as you care to. You're not altogether well, Mason points out. And more of us on the leeward side than you'd ever suspect. There, so, better? Now whisper ear your wish, your fondest wish. Join all those sailors and whores and company writers without number who have found their way down here, who have cried their own desires into the great insatiable. Upon my solicitor's advice, I must also remind you at this point that Ear only listens to wishes. She doesn't grant him. Mason can scarce look into the blue-green radiance surrounding the Ear, In this crowded darkness, even the pale luminescence stuns, and just as well, too, for the organ has now definitely risen up out of its pickle, and without question is offering itself, half cured and subterranean cold, to Mason's approaching mouth. I have survived the royal baby, Mason tells himself. This can be done. The flirtatious ear stands like a shellfish, vibrating, waiting. His fondest wish? That Rebecca live? And that? But he will not betray her for this. Not for this. What he whispers, rather, into the pervading scent of brine and something else, is a speedy and safe passage for Mr. Dixon back to this place. For his personal sake, of course, but for my sanity as well. Helen of Troy, mutatus mutandus, might have smirked. Yet even if the ear were able to smirk, Mason wouldn't have noticed, would he? Being preoccupied so with the metaphysics of the moment. Till now he has never properly understood the phrase calling into a void. Having imagined it said by wives of husbands or teachers of students. Here, however, in the form of this priapic ear is the void and the very anti-oracle revealing nothing as it absorbs everything. One kneels and begs. One is humiliated. One crawls on. The egress you seek is lies directly before you, sir, the mandolin jingling a recessional medley of Indian airs as Mason climbs on. At the moment, all he wants to see is the Atlantic sky. Godspeed, calls Nick Morneville. May you fare better in the life you resume than ever I did, ever did I in the one I abandoned. Having squirmed past the last obstacle, Mason finds himself presently at ground level in the neglected garden he glimpsed earlier. The walls are markedly higher in here than he remembers them from the street whose every audible nuance now comes clear to him, near and far, all of equal loudness, from every part of the town, but invisible. 
In its suggestion of transition between two worlds, the space offers an invitation to look into his soul for a moment before passing back to the port town he has stepped from. A sailor's waterfront chapel, as some would as some would say. He begins, like a dog, to explore the walls, proceeding about the stone perimeter. Bright green vines with red trumpet-shaped flowers, brighter indeed than the day really allows. No doorways of any kind, then rain, salt, from the leagues of vacant ocean. I was in a state. I must have found the way out, unless the real Mason is yet there captive in that exitless patch, and I but his representative. When Dixon hears this, at last, a few days out in their passage back to England, he sits staring at Mason. Well, this is going to seem uncore, but as near as I can calculate, at exactly the instant you spoke into this object, I heard, as out of a speaking trumpet, your message. I was sitting in the world's end. In some wise that no philosophy can explain, the wind outside dropped for just long enough for me to hear. Of course I didn't recognize it as you, Mason. So darkened with echo and so forth, but... That voice? Dixon, I am amazed. My wish as well, you say. Ah, you almost persuaded me. Why can you never just let it be? You had the hook right in my mouth, sir. In Durham, we tend to let the coarse fish go. Oh, I. In favour of what, pray? We look more for carp or salmon trout, though naturally it would be a different, be, dif, be a bit different down where thou do thy fishing. A more predatory style, no doubt. Desperate, as they'd say. Only come up to Wearside some time. We'll teach thee how to wait. I am a Taurus friend. I know how to wait. Ever use a ledger on thy line? A lead sinker in the frome? What a hope! Something would eat it. Aye, so fast you'd never feel a thing. I'm serious, Dixon. Lead? They esteem it a delicacy. Tis just how I talk about places I don't fancy anyone else fishing in. For the sake of the public health, nor should I. Not in those clothiers' la sewer lines that were once my home streams. We grew up feeling obliged to fish, yet certainly not to eat anything we caught. Too many cautionary tales known to all. Much fishing at St Helena? I didn't leave mas masculine in the best of mental health. Perhaps he's been there too long. With orbitally diametric obs in one's plan, why, well, there's never that much choice. But life is so short. Dixon's fizz now all piously, of course I never gossip, but are you suggesting there's some other reason for his long sojourn here, where five minutes is more than enough for some? Mr. Dixon, leaving Dixon just time to shrug unapologetically. What could that possibly be? Six months? A man can pass through an entire phase of his life in that time. Have an adventure? Who knows? You don't mean to raise the possibility of... Friend Mason, who am I to say... "'Tis thou's been with him since October. "'Have there been public displays, "'beauties unintroduced, 
mysterious absences, serious neglected? Happen he's only been going off to drink, as drinking does seem to take up an uncore fraction of people's time here. I have come to believe that masculine lingers only because Bradley discovered the aberration and achieved glory whilst trying to find the parallax of London's zenith star. Might not that great moment of clarity beneath Draco, reasons Mason, masculine, be repeated here, there, beneath the dog. He thinks he'll find something else, like the aberration? He's careful, that's all. If there's anything to it, he'll know soon enough. Did I say anything? I don't even know the lad. Nor I. I'm speculating. Suppose that were it, is all I'm saying. And yet he stays on. He could have come back with us, couldn't he? Has he, in the strangeness of his solitude, reached a compact with the island, as if it were sentient? Has he in some way come to belong to it in perpetuity? The whores bridge his des desert, his trial of passage, abstinence. Or in that place, indulgence, Dixon reminds him. They would rather discuss masculine's affairs than what waits in England in their own futurity. Through his correspondence, masculine has heard of one possibility, though tis far from a reduction to certainty. Following the Chancery decision the year before as to the boundaries between the American provinces of Pennsylvania and Maryland, both proprietors have petitioned the Astronomer Royal for assistance, using the most modern means available in marking these out. One of them being a parallel of latitude, five degrees and hundred leagues of wilderness east to west. Why would, Mel Mas why would Masculine tell us of this? He'd not want it for himself. He'd rather see us permanently abroad than tis alone at last with Dr. Bradley. Would thou go to America? I don't know that Bradley would recommend me again. Mason says, for reasons we appreciate. Nor shall Masculine be too eager if it cannot advance the cause of Lunas. What use, of it, uh, what use is it? Who? Waddington? Yourself? If you're interested, Dixon, after the work you did at the Cape, you may likely write your own contract. That good, was it? Yes. Mine was lucky. The sector practically did the work, but yours was good. Then they'll want to send us both again, won't they? Eh, Bonnie gone on. The two of us in America. I don't think so. End of chapter.